I'm a college student and I'm constantly around the left. Black Lives Matter student protesters and college professors are very angry and are constantly shutting down speech. I believe they are projecting their dysfunction onto others. What type of childhoods did these people have? And did conservative parents fail to instill conservative values into their children? And that's from Torian. Hey, Stefan, how you doing? I'm well, brother. How you doing? I'm doing pretty good. Well, um, dare I ask what you're taking? Oh, uh, psychology. Ah. Yeah. So yeah. there's some fact-based space stuff in there, right? Yeah, yeah. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. It's, but it's much worse than uh, uh, sociology, though. So. Oh, sociology. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's a complete quagmire of historical leftism in my uh, theory and experience. Uh, so, um, This question had came up um, when, uh, you know, Ben Shapiro... Do I know Ben Shapiro? Yeah, Ben Shapiro. He had came to um to to my school, and um, you know there were protesters out there, Black Lives Matter people, and then mm -hmm. I had looked up Ben Shapiro on YouTube, right? And almost everywhere he goes, there are people who who, who won't let you know other students go inside, and they're very um they're very violent as far as like verbal abuse, and. And I, and I think it just really scared me because I'm like, oh, my God, like, these people are like really violent. And it's like I just I just started like wonder, like, what type of childhoods did these people have? And the administrators, you know, I remember someone was talking about how um, the college professors like taught them that. But I don't know why the administrators don't really do anything about it. You, you don't know why. I, I mean, I, I think I know why. I don't know for sure, obviously, but I can hazard a, uh, a fairly reasonable guess that, um, you know, what, what administrators in these kinds of situations, I think, are generally worried about how the media is going to portray any kind of conflicts that they're going to have with activists. And uh, this goes all the way back to the 60s uh, and, and probably a long way before that, too. But the 60s is the first time that I remember um, reading about the, these kinds of conflicts, you know, when the sex, drugs, and rock and roll hippie generation hit the campuses and were protesting and so on. And um, there were some ugly interactions, uh, some ugly battles. And uh, Ronald Reagan, um, then governor of California, um, was content with allowing the, um, uh, well, people, government people with weapons to go in and try and clear out or, or make the space of people who were against uh, the property rights of the university inhabiting particular areas. And it got uh, fairly unpleasant and um, Reagan got pretty angry uh, at the media uh, because he said, you know, that this this whole problem started when the media began saying that there are some laws that people can obey and some laws that they don't have to obey depending on how they feel that day, basically. Right. And so he got really, really upset at uh, them. And, and this happened, you know, happens fairly regularly whenever there's a protest um, from the left then the generally leftist media uh, tends to portray the protesters in as sympathetic as a light as humanly possible and portrays the administrators uh, as um, obviously in somewhat negative ways. And uh, this is changing a little bit, what with people's ability to record stuff on their cell phones and all of that and, and right. see these interactions going down a little bit more. But um, it is a... Um, it's a great challenge. You, you know, you can stand against a lot of injustices if there is a general social consensus that it's a decent thing to do. Right, right, right. Right. So take a, take an extreme example, right? I mean, there there were people, brave, obviously, people who good people, who helped slaves who escaped from plantations get to Canada. It was called the Underground Railroad, and they were very committed, obviously a lot of Christians involved, and, and very much committed to their religious beliefs, and risked enormously uh, a um, huge amount of um, sanctions, uh, very, very important and strict legal sanctions for what, what they were doing, aiding and abetting slave escaping. But the, I think, you know, they, they had courage and they did the right thing, but that there was a whole group of them mm. who were committed to all of this. And you think of the people who hid Jews uh, during... Um, the days of the Second World War in Europe, uh, they uh, were following their conscience and they had a group together who were willing to stand with them. And the great challenge, I think, with standing up against some of the leftist bullying tactics is the degree to which the 
social narrative as defined by the mainstream media is almost universally against you. Right. And the reason why people do that is to make appeasement seem really tempting, right? Oh, you know, let's just give them a little bit. We'll let them have their protest. We'll, you know, because, you know, if I don't stand up to them, it's not that big a deal. But if I do, uh, the media might just turn on me and, and get me fired and smear my name and who knows what, right, what might happen. Um, and so this bullying is designed to tempt you into a kind of moment by moment appeasement by which the left advances their agenda. And uh, there are bullies on the right, too. But right now, at least in the mainstream media, it seems to be more so on the left. So the good news is that, well, the mainstream media is uh, is dying. It's dying off. I mean, Americans' trust in the mainstream media is down to 6%. 6%. That's like congressional levels. So from that standpoint, um, you know, media revenue is down. Ad revenue is down. Click revenue is down. And... Um, they are uh, shooting themselves in the foot. Like it, it often sort of surprises me. I don't know if you've seen this kind of tendency, but um, when, like I looked up recently, there was um, some guy was on a stabbing spree in a mall and an off-duty cop shot him. Mm -hmm. And he had a pretty Anglo name. But, you know, like a lot of people, I was curious about his background. Can you find it in the mainstream media? You cannot. However, you know, it's not like you can't take the guy's name, paste it into Google, and click on images to find out what he looks like. And uh, lo and behold, he just, well, let's just put it this way, he did not look overly anglicized. And so the fact is that you have a very, boom, quick way to find out if the media is withholding information from you. And, uh, you know, we try to do our little bit here as well to bring information to people that the mainstream media often won't get close to. So the mainstream media is, by its sort of constant manipulation of information, uh, is slowly draining any trust, respect, and dollars from the American public. And it's not just happening in America, but elsewhere as well. And you can see this, and Donald Trump talks about the media uh, in, in, let's just say, somewhat negative ways in his rallies or his speeches. I mean, people cheer. Right. I mean, they cheer, I, you know, from within the media, because, the you know, a lot of it is this sort of left-wing echo chamber. From within the media, I think they feel they're doing God's honest work and, and standing up to the negatives and advancing social justice and so on. But I think it's become such a sort of insular star chamber of reflected opinion that I don't think that they, I mean, they all seem completely surprised by the rise of Donald Trump, who has... Um, use the mainstream media, but I think has gained far more traction uh, in, in other areas of communication like the internet and so on. So the good news is the mainstream media is, um, well, it's uh, floating downstream to a potential waterfall. The University of Missouri, yep. um, where there's been a lot of social justice warrior stuff, it's got a hiring freeze and a 5% cut to all recurring general revenue budgets to close a projected $32 million shortfall for the coming fiscal year. Uh, so that's nice. You know, as far as um, people see all this stuff erupting uh, and they read the syllabus, syllabi, they read the course descriptions online. And I'm sure a lot of people wonder exactly why Marxist basket weaving is going to, uh, how it's going to weave into their children's economic future. And um, of course, college is very expensive and people want to get their money's worth. And I think everyone knows that it's uh, not a great economic investment to pay people the equivalent of hundreds of thousands of dollars when you look at foregone income to indoctrinate you into hating the society wherein you're going to have to earn a living, to put it. Um, well, that's a way of putting it that I think is, is fair. And so I think what's happening is people are not wanting to spend that kind of money. You know, of course, also when, when people um, see the student debt that people march out of university with and so on, and they're like, well, right. that's a lot of debt. I don't know how I'm going to pay it off. And I really start to start thinking about the, um, the money I'm going to make versus the money I'm going to spend. And there aren't that many jobs in academia and in the media to go around. 
And the internet doesn't seem to be, well, the internet obviously is much more inclusive, right? I mean, there's people from the left and the right and in between and libertarians and Marxists and all that. So it's, it more accurately reflects, I think, the general disparity or spread of belief systems uh, in, the, uh, in the world or certainly in the country or in the English speaking world. So I think that uh, we may be hitting peak political correctness. Uh, you know, maybe that's, a, maybe that's a winsome dream of mine, but it certainly does seem to be the case. But um, what sort of stuff have you uh, seen or experienced on campus or in classes? Um, well, my, my school, it, it isn't that bad. A lot of, a lot of, the, a lot of what I've seen is um, on different campuses that people post on YouTube and stuff like that. Um, I hope my I hope we don't become like that extreme, but a lot of on my campus a lot of um, the protesting comes from um, the Black Lives Matter movement, and um, there's a lot of um, you know like screaming. There's a lot of like shutting other people down when they when they bring up um, you know like conservative topics or, or Donald Trump and um, and things like that. Or even if you're talking about um, like the, even like the differences between like men and women, you know, people just don't um, don't want to hear it. Well, it's not that they don't want to hear it; they don't want it to be said. Right? Not if, if I don't want to hear something. Like I'm not a big fan of Chinese opera; I don't put it on. Right. If I don't want to hear something, that's perfectly fine. The problem is that they don't want other people to hear it. That's where the I think the real problems come in. Right. And and it's definitely it's definitely like a bubble that people um, live in because you can go through you know your whole twelve years without hearing you know like the conservative point of view. Because I mean I, I was talking to some people about how um, like when I tell them like yeah I kind of support Donald Trump. They're like what like. That's in, like it's it's just mind blowing. Like it's like you know you're not even a real person. You know like, what? That's crazy. Like to even think that you would support a conservative. It's, I don't know. It's just, it's insane. And what are your thoughts on the Black Lives Matter movement? If um, you don't mind me asking. Um. I mean, when I when I read the reports about how you know the Black Lives Matter movement, when the police officers are afraid to arrest, you know, black, you know, teenagers who are doing crime in the neighborhoods. And the black, you got a whole group of people telling police officers that what you're doing is, is bad, you guys are evil, and how that's increasing, you know, the crime rates in our neighborhoods. I mean, <clears throat> I don't know, it, it, it saddens me because it's like, it's sort of a, like masochistic. It's like you, you think you're helping black people out, but you're, you're, helping criminals out because you're saying you're, you're making excuses for criminals in a, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a indirect way. And so, um, and, and I also think that it's, it's really used to, to guilt white people, um, into, um, into, you know, shutting up into, into feeling guilty. And I just think a lot of white people just bought into that, you know, it's like, I just hate that, like, oh my God, like I'm, you know, I have to, I have to, like this, this woman on Huffington Post, she had written an article apologizing to black people, and I'm like, I don't, it's, it sickens me. It's like, you don't have to apologize for anything, like, but like when you apologize, you're gonna, you're, you're helping them out. You're, you're saying what you're doing is okay, like you, your, your feelings are justified. Right. Yeah. No. I mean. Um... It does not help black people out right. unless unless the black people we're talking about are criminals, in which case having the cops hold off. Great for them. <laughs> just not not that great for everybody else who lives in the community. Right. 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 Exactly. Exactly. And I think and I think people don't even realize, like, I mean, because I, I grew up in a, you know, sort of I, I, some most people will call it the hood. But it's like. There, you know, there's break ins, there's there's dudes who break in your doors, who rob you. And it's like and a lot of the black people are victims of these other black criminals so it's like you don't even have compassion for really your own brothers and sisters who are getting shot up by the people that you're trying to protect you know right. like it, um 
No, I, 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 I understand. It is, uh, it is, you know, I mean, the frustration that I see, I'm obviously not deeply embedded in the black community, but the frustration that I have around these kinds of things is nothing I can imagine compared to the frustration that people who are more direct victims of this kind of, um, these kinds of problems mm -hmm. is, um, I mean, it must just be staggering. I mean, um, it is, uh, uh, there's a lot of danger in these neighborhoods and, uh, you know, this driving back police, uh, out of fear of being the next Darren Wilson or whatever, um, is, uh, I think it's getting a lot of people killed statistically. Right. What was the evolution of your political thought? How did you end up on the Trump train? Um, <laughs> so first of all, no, when I was in uh, high school, I really didn't really care about politics. I was really into like, um, you know, like the religion and atheist uh, battle and stuff like that. So, I, I thought you were going to say girls, <laughs> but that was just that was just me. But uh, yeah, that, yeah. that's cool too. <laughs> so, so I really wasn't in really, really politics, but I was. I mean, I guess I consider myself a liberal because, like, liberal, it just seemed like you know, you it seems like you're, you're like the good guy because all I heard about conservatives was that they were racist, they were just evil people. And then, yeah, liberal is like nice, right? You yeah, you're a nice people. person. You care about minorities. You care about fairness and justice. And I don't know. I mean, do you want to go into the plantation of the Republicans? You must be mad. Right, 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 right. And 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 so, I think it was like when um I read like some of Thomas Sowell, and I was like, oh my god, he is so smart. <laughs> and he really and, is. <laughs> yeah, and I was reading Thomas Sowell, and I was like, oh man, like yo, that. Like this, he has like some good points, you know, about conservatism and, and stuff like that. And um, and I started to read about, you know, the black, how the black family was in like 1920, 1930. And a lot of those traditions, you know, wait until you're married, two parent household, you know, the rise in um, black income. It was just amazing. I was like, oh, my God, like I've, ne I I've never heard about that. Like no one ever talks about that little time snippet. Of, of black people improving and well because it's all like the dungeon of slavery to the underperformance of today is just one unbroken grim line of maybe a tiny bit but the fact that there's been significant bulges of black achievement of, of harlem renaissance of of blacks getting into the middle class and becoming professionals well that can't be talked about because that doesn't go with the narrative right because if there was success in the past then it can't just be, I don't know, this magical blanket white racism that burns everything in its path and is unstoppable and irredeemable, apparently. Like, that that doesn't fit the narrative, and so you probably never heard about it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, 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 and if they do talk about it, they always say the downfall of the black community it was the drug war. They don't say welfare. It was like, it wasn't the welfare. It was the drug war that took the African-American males out of the home. But my thing is, okay, if, if marijuana, like, you know, let's say marijuana, cocaine, if that's illegal, then we shouldn't be doing it in the first place. So the real question is, why are African-American males doing that in the first place? Well, Japanese Americans were also subject to the drug war, right. but didn't end yeah. up in, in jail to that degree, right? Exactly, exactly. And so... Now, to, to be fair... I mean, I mean, I, I hate the drug war, so it's not a war on drugs, it's a war on people, and, you know, so... But I don't think it's the sole explanation. Right, 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 yeah, right, yeah, I agree, I agree. And so, you know, throughout college, when I got in my, my first meet, my first uh, year here, um, I, I was really hit hard with the, with the feminism. Because in high school, I really didn't know what feminism was. But I was really hit hard with the feminism. I was like, oh, my God. Like, it, it, really, it really hurt me, like, emotionally. Because I was like, yo, these women, like, hate me. And it, and it, it really hurt. And I was like, yo, like, I can't. I, I, I started, like, I, I just couldn't support that. And it's like. Wait, hang on. What, uh, Torian, what do you mean? I mean, the, 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 the women hate you. How, how did you get that? How did that? I'm not, I'm not disagreeing with you. Yeah. I'm just, I want to know that, okay. like, how that came about in your head, in your heart. Great, great, great. So, okay, let me think. Oh, boy. So, um. So, you, you're walking into class. Right. You're a happy guy. You're whistling. Right. You're like, hey, I'm in college. Right. This is going to be great. Right. And then, patriarchy. Yeah. <laughs> like, the men all just falling down, uh, trying to use their ball sack to cover their hearts. Yeah, I, I, absolutely, absolutely. You know, and it was like, um, yeah, patriarchy. My first year, I went to this. It was Apple Service Learning, where we volunteer. You go out to the community, you volunteer, you help out. That whole thing was a cover story of trying to brainwash us into feminism. And I'm like, yo, hold up, what, why are we talking about women being victims here? To, to you know, for men. And in, in our school, we have a lot of these, um, 
events where they will talk about, you know, whatever, if, whether if it's rape or domestic abuse, and it's always the female as the victim from a man. And it's like, okay, the, the fact that you're not even talking about male victims, I smell something fishy here. It's like, what are you, what are you trying to say? Well, Tori, and I, I, I hate to interrupt you, but um, the thought popped into my head that if you grew up in a hoodish neighborhood, you said it wasn't exactly the hood, but if you grew up in a hoodish neighborhood, is it fair for me to say that you may have witnessed an instance or two of female aggression? Oh, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. absolutely. Okay, absolutely. good. I'm glad we're on the same page as far as that goes. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's a whole other top. Yeah, that's, yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Exactly, exactly, exactly. I mean, much of a patriarchy in the hood? No, hell no. Hell no. I'm sorry. No, no. Um, so, so, you know, I learned about that, and I learned, and, and, and it was becoming very, um, I don't know. It was it was it was becoming like you know left sided, like left, like you know you teach about socialism, you teach about, you know. It was it was a lot of demonizing, I guess, like the other side, and so, I think when Donald Trump. Finally oh, hang on. Sorry, just before sorry to interrupt you again. Just before we get to Donald Trump, so when you were in this mm -hmm. environment. Mm -hmm. Did you have an impulse to say, well, wait a minute, uh, I've heard of this or, you know, half of the so, victims of domestic abuse are men? And, and like, did you, uh, was yes. there an impulse in you to sort of bring some other facts to the front or to even ask questions? And did you try that? Huh? Okay, so here's the thing. So here's the thing. Here's the thing. In class, you know, I, I did, I did not. I mean, when, when I was talking with people individually, I did, though. Like, I would tell them, like, I would tell them like, how I feel about these things. But in class, um, to my professors, I, I did not. I did it. And I'm, listen, I'm not saying you should have. Yeah. What I'm curious about is what was the um, what, what was in the air or what was in the atmosphere that made you feel cautious about that? Okay, so I think it's, I think it's two parts. Really, it was. And it was really two parts. I think one was, I guess, like the other. I mean, I mean, I guess it's kind of. Oh, it was. I, I think it was really like the other students and how. I know that I felt that. I think sometimes I feel like, man, like if I if I say this, you know, in class or whatever, it may be like like a dumb argument, and I feel like that the. the the amount of heat I may get, you know what I'm saying? I don't know. Did you did you see other like did you see smoking craters where other questioning students yeah. actually tried to exercise critical thinking? Yeah, 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 yeah. And they were like yeah. frog marched out of the room by pear shaped women. I mean, what happened? Yeah, no. So, so um, I think. Um, also, I think that a lot. I think a lot of the times it was very. I, honestly, it was very like uniform. Really, I don't. Cause, cause yeah, there's there's no room for discussion. Right, 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 right. Everyone agrees, and right. you know, you know what's going to happen if you disagree. Those sinister eyeballs are going to turn on you, and right, right, and and I hate and I hate that. I hate you know because I kind of I want to say it was kind of cowardly, but you know, um, I just yeah, I hate it. I, I wouldn't characterize it that way myself. There's an old saying. I don't know. Discretion is the better part of valor. In other words, you got to know. You got to pick your battles, right. you know, know when to hold them, know when to fold them. And if uh, if there's really no chance of getting anything other than a negative outcome, yeah. you know, right. uh, I, I, I don't play. <laughs> I just, I'm not going right, to play. Right. And, um, and it's a shame, too, because you want to have a voice as somebody who may be skeptical of some of these arguments. I mean, you don't want to go to school to be lectured at and be afraid to speak up. That seems like a not great thing to pay for, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, because, you know, to engage in critical thought, to engage in debate and all that kind of stuff would seem to be kind of the point of going to school, learning how to think rather than just right. absorbing and, and repeating. Right, right. Um. And... How's it been for you um, socially with this uh, these perspectives? Absolutely. So socially, it was it was funny because I started I was I listened to your show when I started listening to your shows about you know um, anarcho capitalism whatever, and 
crazy bastard. What are you trying to do? Like rob yourself of all social contact? <laughs> what are you thinking? No, no, no. I'm sorry. No, Wait till after school. It, no, I'm kidding. Go ahead. So I had really like this. My, one of my first, well, well, I would say my first, my freshman year, no, my sophomore year, it was this anarchy group that's still here. And I went to a couple of their meetings, but I was like, this is not cap. Like, where's the capitalism? It wasn't even really, it was like a serious group, but they were kind of like communists. I'm like, what the hell y'all talking about? So right. I was like, so I was like, okay, yeah, they're kind of loony a little bit. And then I remember one time I had this roommate from England. Oh my God. And I was, and I was listening to your show a little bit and, and he had overheard you. He was like, oh, is that Steph Bot? I was like, oh yeah, yeah, what you know about him, man? And he was like, it, uh, what do you say? But he said some like some mean things. And I was like, oh, what you mean? Like we, we started talking about uh, libertarianism and, and he agreed you know, we talk about the taxation thing. He agreed, yeah, it's, it is forced. He agreed that. But he was very, I didn't feel comfortable talk. We, we talk about it a couple of times, but I really just didn't bring it up. And he will always, and I would still post things on Facebook. And he will always like um, hit me with, um, okay, you're a hypocrite because you're, you're in college. Like it was, I don't want to say, it was really, I felt it was really hurtful things. That he was well, they're not arguments, right? I mean, to, to take an extreme example, I mean, uh, some slave is against slavery. He's like, well, you're a hypocrite because you're still living on the plantation. It's like, right. well, sorry. I, you know, there's not a whole lot of choice in some things. If you want to advance and, you know, you can't be a psychologist without getting the education. That's the licensing requirements. And uh if that's the game you got to play, that's the game you got to play. But it's not an argument, you know, the argument from personal hypocrisy when there's not really any choice. Right. Uh, you know, you're you're using government roads and therefore, you it's know, like, it's oh. like, well, is there a choice? Do I have non-government roads to choose from? Do I have a choice about paying for them? Well, right, right. And um, um, some of the other people I talked to um, about this. They were um they weren't as like as mean as that other guy, but they um they still really didn't accept it. Like I remember I was talking to um this one girl about you know because I talk I talk I like to talk about gender two and single moms and things like that. That's definitely not really understood because a lot of these because a lot of these kids they grew up with single moms too. So I understand that's that's a very uh, touchy topic for them. Um. But it's not. We don't. I I have. I feel like I haven't really uh, convinced um, anyone. Well, it's it's tough, you know, because I mean, if you start talking about the negative results of single motherhood, then you have to confront people who say, "Well, women are just the same as men, and women don't need men," and so on. You have to confront them with the harm this is doing to children. Right. And that often produces a kind of short circuit, like nobody wants to advocate something that's harmful for children, but at the same time, they have to argue that men and women are identical and a woman doesn't need a man and so on, right? Right, 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 right. And, and, even, and even in the textbooks, I remember talking about, because I'm, I'm a big, I'm a big person for, for non-spanking, you know, I, try, I, I, um, I, you know, I try to tell parents um, about the consequences of spanking and things like that, right? And so... There's this, this class I haven't taken it yet, but African American children, basically, right? And I was, I was, and 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 you know, for every for, for the white people, for the for the Asian people, for the, all the other races, spanking negatively affects you, right? But for every for for black people, somehow it's okay, you know. It's like, or even even if you look at um two parent households, you know, they they keep saying that single parents, you know, they do just as well. So it's like. But those aren't the facts that I'm hearing on the internet, though. But in our textbooks, it's telling us, you know, it's, I don't know, it's excusing blacks and women. Well, I mean, corporal punishment, to put as nice a phrase around it as possible, Tor uh, Torin, is, is, is very prevalent in the black community, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, it is. I used to I sometimes think, yeah, blacks are really great at basketball because that's how they raise their kid. Bounce hit, bounce hit, bounce hit. And uh, I just think it's uh, it's brutal. And, you know, one of the things that I was very happy about in this show was, you know, during the Trayvon Martin, George Zimmerman, uh, I got to millions of people, the, the message of non-spanking. And since I knew a lot of blacks were going to watch that uh, video, I really am very happy the degree to which that 
that came across. So the numbers are like 89% of black parents, 79% of white parents, 80% of Hispanic parents, and 73% of Asian parents said they have Spanx their uh, children. And I think that there's good data to show that spanking black children affects them more negatively right. than, say, Asian kids. And that's to do with the warrior gene and other stuff that, that you know, is still not that well understood genetically, but, but seems to have some sort of effect. Right, right, right. I mean, the warrior gene prevalence, which um, can be triggered by child abuse, blacks 5.5% of the population, Caucasians 0.1%, Asians, hang on, are you ready? Zero point zero 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 seven percent. So um, it is, it is a tragic cycle. Um, was your dad around when you were growing up? Yes, he was. I knew it. I should have. I should. You know what? <laughs> I hate doing. I hate guessing because I'm like, let me guess. Your dad was around, but no. Oh man! And I was, I was thinking earlier. I'm like, I'm gonna go, and then I chickened out. I shouldn't have chickened <laughs> out. I knew it. I knew your dad was around. But go on. How do you, how do you know he was around? How do I know your dad was around? Yeah. Because you're not a social justice warrior. Ah. Uh, Single moms produce social justice warriors. Women are very frail. Women are very dependent, especially women with kids, right? I mean, they need a lot of resources. And that frailty uh, is one of the ways in which uh, kids grow up around single moms and end up viewing the world as a very dangerous place. Because for single moms, it kind of is. Mm -hmm. But as far as, but as far as the, the aggression and the and the and the hatred and the violence. So that so assuming so if that's the case, then single moms must a lot of them must be. Because I was thinking about that early. Because I don't want to say more violent, but if you're a single mom, right? You 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 have to be even more. You have to be even more aggressive because you don't got two people. So you gotta you gotta clamp 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 down on your child even more. Cause I was I was watching this other mom, you know she was very like, come over here like you you know you gotta like, clamp down on them even more because you don't got the dad to help you out, so I guess well and there's there's a lack of respect a lot of times for people who grew up in single mother households particularly among the boys, and so yeah the the women have to become like uh, extra oh, heavy hammers uh, to try and overcome some of the lack of respect that they receive and there's something as well um, that uh, female cops tend to shoot people more than male cops. Mm -hmm. because they can't physically intimidate them. And again, I'm not saying that parents should be like cops or anything like that, but uh, I'm guessing that you... Okay, here, I'm going out of my guessing game. <laughs> Woohoo! Um, but, you, you know, you respect your dad, and a good relationship with your dad. Your dad's like a stable guy who's around and involved with his kids. Is that all fair to say? I think that's fair to say. Good, good. Well, okay, then that would be one of the main reasons why... You're able to, you know, grow up and value peaceful parenting and be a good critical thinker and curious uh, and so on. And I think that's one of the reasons why running into some of these people who I think are pretty damaged is kind of bewildering, right? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's like, like, oh, my God. Like, I don't I don't know if I'm crazy or they're crazy because it's like if, 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 if well, I mean, I, I'm, I, I know I'm not crazy, but, you know, when when they're protesting so hard, I'm like, okay, they can't be faking it. Like, this is coming from deep within, you know, their soul and stuff like that, right? So it's like, they view, let's just talk about conservatives, right? You know, xenophobic, misogynistic, you know, just bad people. They view those people like you would view the Ku Klux Klan, you would view slavery. So for them, it's justified. And, and I was thinking earlier, I was like, what would make me so upset that a speaker would come in and I would yell at them? And I was like, I, I just <laughs> you, I mean, you got stuff to do, <laughs> right, 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 exactly. I'm busy, <laughs> but 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 <laughs> but, it, it, but even if it was like the Ku Klux Klan, which I don't, which I which I mean I don't like, I don't give a shit. Like I don't care. Well, what are there eight left? I mean, it's not like it's not like a big parade of Casper the Friendly Ghost going down Main Street these days. I mean, uh, the Klan is, uh, to my knowledge, not a substantial social or political force in America, and hasn't been for I don't know how many generations. Uh, but yeah, I mean, if if people are around that I significantly disagree with, um, why would I necessarily have to go down right. and chant and scream and cover myself in blood and or fake blood or whatever it is that that these people do and you know, like Triggly Puff, I don't know if you've seen this, can't get it out of my yeah, brain saw, yeah. <laughs> video, but, um, you know, she seems pretty committed. Uh, right, right. 
Uh, and, and I, you know, the more intelligent people are, and I think one of the definitions of intelligence is the ability to hold an opposing viewpoint, understand it without agreeing with it. Mm -hmm. Right. Like I, I can understand where social justice warriors are coming from. I can understand where leftists are coming from. I can understand where communists, if you take, if you believe certain things at the beginning, everything kind of goes like domino. So if you believe that men and women are identical and make exactly the same decisions, then the, the wage gap, or sorry, the gender gap in wages is unjust, right? If you, if you think, okay, well, redhead people are exactly the same as other people, but redhead people are only paid 77 cents on the dollar, then it makes some sense to start crying out about prejudice. And so if you believe that, um, you know, all the ethnicities are the same, all the men and women are the same, everyone's this Buck Rogers blob of identicalness, then all discrepancies must be due to some sort of prejudice or whatever it is. Like with the communists, right? If, if workers are exactly the same as owners, they're just as smart, just as competent, it's just an accident of history that one of them's in the head office and one of them's on the factory floor, I can understand that you would think that this is an injustice that needs to be remedied. So I can really understand all of these positions that I significantly disagree with. I can hold them in my head. I could probably argue those positions uh, pretty well. But that doesn't mean I accept them. But I think that there are some people, and a lot of people, sadly, these days on campuses, who cannot understand and appreciate an opposing argument. It becomes so emotionally threatening to them that they respond as if there's a genuine threat in the room. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, how uh, how did you get introduced to uh, DJ, DJ Trump? How did that come about oh, for you? Man, when he, um, at first, I was like, at first, it was last, it was last summer. And people were talking about, oh, Trump running, Trump running. And I was like, I didn't even take it serious. I was like, why, why is he, what is he doing? And then, and then he had said something about the, the Mexican rapists. And I was like, oh hell, he he his career is over. His career. Is over. <laughs> He's talking about you 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 don't do that. You just do not do that. And and then he was um and then I think it was that knockdown with Mel Megan Kelly. She asked him, what do you think about the war on women? He was like, listen, I don't got time. We don't have time for the correctness. And I was like, oh my god, this man has so like he has so much courage. Like people like him, you know, Ann Kotler, like. These people are taking the bullets to save, you know, I know you said Western civilization is, is, has already fallen, but they're trying to take the bullets of keeping the remains of Western civilization. I was like, oh. I, I don't know. I've gone quite that far, but okay. it's, it's definitely something we should keep an eye on. Let's put it that way. Right. right. And, I was like, and I was like, yo, like, I don't know. It was crazy. I don't know. I was like, oh, my God. Like, this, he's like a hero. It's, uh. Just, I mean, just, just to put himself out there like that and just destroy, you know, these leftists, you know, these people who are lying about him. It's like it, it just took so much courage. That's what I'm saying, that courage. And I don't think people like people, you know, they look at me like, oh, my God, you support this crazy guy. I, I, he has courage. Like that, that takes courage to do that. And um, I don't know. And I think I, I think it kind of. um. You know, lately when I'm talking to people who I feel who I feel comfortable talking with, who disagree with me, I think I'm I'm being kind of being more candid of why, um, why I support Donald Trump and things like that. You know, and it's like I don't have to be ashamed. You don't have to be ashamed to to have, um, you know, some conservative values. There's nothing to be ashamed about that. There's nothing to be ashamed to say. Yeah, I think you should wait till you're married. I, you know, I think two parents household is the best. Um. You know, I um I think that I, I care about my country and I don't want people who aren't smart enough who want to live on welfare over here. There's nothing to be ashamed about that. You care about your country. And I mean, I mean and it's, I'm not it's, even it's, like weird, a it's weird for people to hear that. It's weird for people to hear. Let's try and figure out how we can serve Americans through through government rather than try and serve everyone else around the world at the expense of, of the Americans. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah, Aunt Kohler, Aunt Kohler was saying, it, it was crazy, she said, um, we, and the United States isn't a batter's women's shelter. I was like, yo, that's true. Like, why, like, why do we have to accept crappy people? Like, why, do we, why can't we accept the best of the best? Right. 
Yeah, I mean, Australia has a point system wherein, you know, your education and your um, work history and all that go towards calculating particular points. Australia has a point system. Um, uh, I think uh, most of Europe seems to have greased jetpacks to send people from place to place. But um, uh, it is, uh, it is rea the reality is that America is a golden ticket to the planet. And there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of millions of people who, if given the opportunity and a portal, would move to America in a heartbeat, which would destroy the entire economy. You know, in the past, before the welfare state, people came and they either contributed economic value or they went home. And a third of people who came over from other countries in the 19th century went back home. But with the welfare state, eh, no, it does not happen, right? Natives use welfare at 30 percent, immigrants at 51 percent and illegal immigrants at 62 percent. Mm -hmm. So those people coming in are breaking the back of the American economy. And... That is particularly brutal. And, you know, I, I think about – and I hate to use this big giant blob, so I apologize for doing so. But when I sort of think about the poorer black community, well, the welfare state can't continue. $20 trillion in debt and Bernie Sanders gets in power. Oh, man, it's going to be brutal because Bernie Sanders has been calculated – that he's going to add $20 trillion over a decade to American debt. Yes. I mean, come on, people. Why, why 20? Why not 50? Why not a billion? Why not a Googleplex trillion billion quill? Why not just keep writing numbers until your arm falls off? Because at that point, right. it's just monopoly money anyway. So when the welfare state starts to run out of money, well, it'd be real nice if people had jobs. And among the poorer blacks, and this not particularly true to the poorer blacks, but demographically and statistically, there are more of them. It's kind of important that they have jobs. And the fact that a bunch of illegal immigrants are coming in driving down wages is um, brutal on the black community, because what it does is it means that having uh, welfare is uh, better than getting a job, at least in the short run. Right, right. And that means once you get welfare, you get single mom families, you get hood culture, you get uh, all this mess. So it, it is a huge ripple effect or I guess a domino effect that happens. And, um, you know, I can't, I can't tell you, man, I just, you know, just you and me and I guess everyone else who <laughs> listens to this story. And I can't tell you, like, I listen to myself, like, hey, I'm talking about borders and illegal immigration. And, and it's like, Hey man, weren't you an anarchist once? It's like, well, still am, still am, but there's strategy and then there's tactics, right? Right, right. Strategy is long-term tactics is short-term. And right now, I'm just descending a little bit from the ivory tower of strategy, a little bit more into tactics because uh, I just want to be able to keep having a conversation about this stuff. Right. And I just, I, can I just give you a little? You got some time, right? You're not. Yeah. You don't have. You you don't have any place you have to be immediately. Okay. So this is interesting because a lot of people get confused about this thing of Donald Trump said when Mexico sends their people, they're not sending the best or something like that, right? And people don't understand that. What do you mean Mexico sends their people? <laughs> I don't know if you know this, but um, the Mexican government has put out a significant number of pamphlets. And <laughs> can you guess what those pamphlets have something to do with? Um, I'm going to guess how to get welfare in America. How just how to get into America. Okay. Oh, no, don't worry. Once you're in America, there'll be plenty of people who'll help you get welfare who work for the welfare department. Don't worry about that. The question is, how do you get into America. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but uh, here we go. Dear fellow citizen, this guide tries to provide you with some practical advice that may be useful to you in case you have made the difficult decision to seek new work opportunities outside of your own country. The safe way to enter another country is by first obtaining your passport, which is issued by the halala and halala and blah, 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 blah. However, <laughs> you know, however, plan B, which seems to be plan A for a lot, um, we actually see many cases of Mexicans who try to cross the northern border without the necessary documentation, crossing high-risk zones that are very dangerous, especially in desert areas or rivers with strong and not always noticeable currents. As you read this guide, you can also learn some basic questions about legal consequences of your stay in the United States of America without appropriate immigration documents, as well as the rights you have in that country once you are there independent of your immigration status. You know what? I'm sorry. I said they didn't. They did. You're right. They told you exactly what to do when you get over there. Dangers of crossing in high-risk zones. Crossing the river can be very risky, especially if you cross alone and at night. Thick clothing weighs you down when it's wet and makes it hard to swim or float. If you cross in the desert, try to travel when the heat is not so intense. You know, I'm, I'm not happy with people coming across who need that kind of instruction. 
Um, highways and towns are very far apart, so it could take you several days to find roads, and you will not be able to carry food or water for that long. You could even get lost. Salted water helps you retain body fluids, although if you get more thirsty, although you get more thirsty if you drink salted water, um, the risk of dehydration is lessened. And then they give you a bunch of dehydration uh, symptoms. Um, uh, if you get lost, follow utility poles, railroad tracks, or furrows. Be careful of alien smugglers. Please see pages 8 to 9. Be careful of polleros, coyotes, or pateros, various names for alien smugglers, of course. They can deceive you by assuring you they'll cross you, smuggle you across the border, at certain times over mountains or through deserts. This is not true. You can put your life in danger, leading you, they can put your life in danger, leading you through rivers, irrigation canals, desert areas, along railroad tracks or freeways. This has caused the death of hundreds of people. And uh, anyway, um, do not use false documents. Just, you know, go without any documents. Uh, if you are tamed, do not resist arrest. Do not throw stones or other objects at the officers, nor at the patrol cars, because that is considered a form of provocation. <laughs> really? It's good that they, uh, uh, that's good to know. Do not hide in dangerous places. Do not cross freeways. Uh, and anyway, so uh, if you are arrested, you have rights. Mm. Give your true name. If you are a minor and accompanied by an adult, tell the authorities so that they do not separate you. And anyway, I won't sort of go on. We'll put the link to this below. But, um, you know, I guess they spend a bunch of money printing up these pamphlets. Um, do you um, think that it might be vaguely possible that they could have taken some of that money and put border guards somewhere along this way? <laughs> no. So, and why is the Mexican government doing this? Well, they say, well, people are going to do it anyway, so we might as well give them safe ways to do it. But the reality is that um, what happens is Mexicans get to America, they get jobs, and they wire money back to Mexico, right, right. like huge amounts of money. This is one of the ways in which the actual illegal immigration st numbers in um, uh, America are uh, calculated, is trying to figure out how much, uh, you know, Mexico Central Bank reported Mexicans overseas sent nearly $24.8 billion home in 2015, which is like close to the amount that Mexico gets from like the sale of all its oil. Uh, and I don't just mean for hair gel, although obviously that's a lot. Um, but uh, yeah, they're they giving you guides to how to cross. Um, you are, um, you know, uh, you, all the rights that you have, what you can do when you get across, uh, best ways to um, uh, not get uh, detained, uh, and just crazy stuff, right? So this is, um, and, and you know, they do say on the last page, to be fair, this consular protection guide is not promoting the crossing of the border of Mexicans without legal documentation required by the government of the United States. Its objective is to make known the risks implied and to inform about the rights of migrants regardless of their legal residence. So, I don't know. It's hard to say that a particular behavior is uh, really strongly condemned by a government which gives you pamphlets on the best ways to achieve that behavior. Uh, oh, so, um, uh, yeah. So, when he says Mexico doesn't send their... Well, the Mexican government is giving you pamphlets on how to cross. I mean, I shouldn't laugh because it's brutal. And this is where, of course, 80 percent of the women get raped en route. Uh, it's just it's shocking. And I would imagine the number may even be higher. Right. But um, and I'm sorry to have interrupted. And this is why I asked you if you if you had time, because I'm really enjoying the chat. Right. But this, you know, guide to getting into America so that you can send American taxpayers welfare money back mm -hmm. to Mexico. I mean, it's like, man, you've got to be kidding. That, 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 yeah, that's smart. I mean, on their part, that's smart on their part because it's, you know, they have an investment in it also. It's, I don't know. It's just crazy how when you have free stuff, I mean, you know, people are going to set up any any kind of way to, to get that free stuff. You know, this in this case, is welfare. So people will do, you know, it's, it's people who got welfare, who, who who cheat in the system, maybe working a little bit, careful about how many hours they go over. So it's, I mean, that's what happens when you get free stuff. Um, right. and, it, and, it, and it reminded me of, of, of the perspectives that the left has and the right has. For example, in my Spanish class, they, she showed a video about immigration, right? But it was, um, it was a video for us to feel compassionate about the people who are crossing illegally. And it, it was about like a, a year and a half ago. And I was like, man, like I feel for those people. Like, Cause you know, like a lot of the class, some of the people were crying in the class. Cause like, man, these people are crossing illegally. You got gangs over there. They just want to get a better life. Oh, it's horrible stuff. No question. Right, right, right. But then, 
you get the conservative perspective and they're saying, yo, that's illegal. They're coming over here, they're getting welfare, and it's like, hold on, wait a second. So you were trying to make me feel compassion for these people, but at the same time, they're doing it illegally. And they're taking benefits from it. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, look, I mean, um, Mexico has lived next to one of the giant engines of capitalism for what, 150? I don't know. I'm, not, I'm no expert on it. A long time. Let's just put it that way. Many, many generations. Mexico has lived right next to one of the great experiments in limited government and free market capitalism. And what have they done with that? What, what have they done living next to and viewing? It's not like they've got to learn ancient Sanskrit and burrow Indiana Jones style under some ziggurat with flying headless monkeys or something. They live right next door. You know, it's sort of like uh, if, if there's some band that's playing the most beautiful music right next door and they say to me, man, you can, you can record this music and you can just go sell it. We don't care. And I don't do it. Well, okay. <laughs> Could be considered a tad lazy. I certainly can't complain about being broke, right? Because people would pay millions for this music. Right. And all Mexico has to do is look north and say, okay, well, this is how successful economic societies work. You know, looking north and a little bit back in time, perhaps. Mm -hmm. So I have a huge amount of sympathy for the migrants. I mean, according to the footprints, Mexico sucks to the tune of like, what, a quarter of its entire population has moved to the United States or right, right back and forth. But as far as Hispanics, uh, at least the ones who are interviewed uh, about political opinions in the United States, what do they want? Well, they want more government services and they want to pay less taxes. Hmm. <laughs> Hmm, you all can count, right? And so, you know, whether it's an IQ thing, and there are, you know, reports that Hispanic IQ is in the high 80s or low 90s or whatever, so maybe they just don't have the intellectual horsepower to vote for the long-term gains and short-term pains of getting a free market. I don't know what it is. But if they are not smart enough to have a free market in their own country, coming to America is not going to make America better. It's going to make it worse, but if there's a welfare state. And if they are smart enough to do it, but they simply haven't, well, uh, I don't know what to say, but that also doesn't seem to be a huge net positive to America. Right, right, right. When, um, you know, I don't want to just ask you questions because you're a black guy, because, you know, that's not, you know, <laughs> not how I roll. But did you, I mean, you heard the KKK thing, right? Like, I disavow, like David Duke saying, yeah, you know, I can see some positive things. Yeah, in, yeah, yeah, in absolutely, yeah, Donald Trump. yeah. Um, what was your what were your thoughts about that? Um, my whole thing was like, this not this shouldn't even this isn't an issue. Like you can't control the you can't control people who you, if you if, there are some people who um, who support you know Donald Trump Bernie Sanders um, and a lot of and some of them are crazy, but. My thing is you have to look at the principles of what that person is saying. So it's like, so yeah, you're going to get some crazy people. You're going to get some good people. But it's like, that's not even, it's not even an issue. It's like, I don't, it's just like, why are we talking about that? Okay. A Ku Klux Klan member who supports Donald Trump. Donald Trump isn't, isn't part of the Ku Klux Klan. Why are we talking about this? Like, it's not, I mean, you're trying to attain his name, but it's just, I don't know. It's ridiculous. Like. Well, Hillary Clinton's mentor was Robert Byrd, was it? a longtime member of the KKK. Don't hear a lot about that, but some guy talks about Donald Trump, and suddenly it's all over the news, and uh, I don't know. And the racism thing, does this, because um, I don't think anyone's really talked much about anything to do with Donald Trump being racist against blacks, but of course, you know, the big Hispanic uh, question, although I'm pretty sure if you run a lot of hotels, you can't do that without Hispanics who like working for you. But uh, do you take any... Um, any credence in that stuff? Or do you, uh, no, I mean, you, don't, the only uh, thing I know he said about blacks was, <laughs> he said, uh, black people love me. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, man, man. And, and, but it's true. Like, he got like, what, 15 plus percent? It, it, 25 percent, I've heard of some of the black voters going to Trump. And, and, and it's like, that's more than like any of the uh, past presidents or these conservatives. And it's like, man, like, black people really like feeling him. So, it's just he's a regular, he's just a regular guy, a businessman. He don't care what color your skin is. He just he just want you to work hard, you know. Um, and I don't, I don't even I don't know. I mean, he hasn't said really think anything about black people, but I think the I think the, the the sexist thing is what's really getting people though, because um, 
I don't know if you saw, but there's just there's just on Huffington Post. It was a it was a list of all the sexist things Donald Trump said, and so, I mean, basically, you you can discount the things that he said, he, the mean things he said about women because I mean, look, you can say that about men too. So that's off the tar- chart, whatever. And then he may have said some weird, funny jokes about you know like his daughter. That's just humor. So I think um, like I remember when he was talking about how. Um, the later, the lady reporter, he was like, "You wouldn't have gotten this job if you weren't beautiful." And I was talking to my friend about that. She was like, "That is so sexist." But I was like, "That's true. That's true. If you want to be a reporter on national television, you have to look good. If you're ugly, they're not gonna hire you." So he was just telling the truth about that. But I think I can't really recall exactly what. But when he says like, um, I think he said something about. Oh no no no! I know there was a clip where Hillary Hillary Clinton was talking about how she he was like asked uh, um, something about trusting women. He was like, "Well, I can't answer that or something like that." I don't know, but I think I think I think people kind of get the vibe that he's like a um, like I don't think he's like the real sexist, like a real real sexist, but he is kind of like you know, like I'm the man of the house, so I make the money, and and she has her place kind of thing. I don't know. Well, I mean, I'm, he, he certainly said some negative things about Rosie O'Donnell, but recently Rosie O'Donnell said that Donald Trump couldn't become president because his mouth looks like an anus. <laughs> First of all, I don't think that's true. I haven't done a Google shop comparison, but uh, and I'm not going to. But, um, you know, where's the outrage again? It's it's the usual thing is, oh, women are being victimized. And, uh, right, right. You know, his, uh, his kids seem to have turned out pretty well. Very well, I would say. Right. And uh, that certainly seems to be a step up from something, some of the stuff that seems to have turned out with Rosie O'Donnell's kids. But, um, yeah, I mean, it's it's just this double standard. I mean, people make fun of Donald Trump's appearance all the time, mm-hmm. you know, uh, and, and that's just par for the course. But then the moment he makes fun of some woman's appearance, even in, in passing and in, in semi-private, oh, you know, like, I mean, I, I thought... I thought we were supposed to be about equality here. Right. Where are the feminists complaining right. that people are making fun of Donald Trump uh, looking like an orange piece of ham with a orangutan comb over? I mean, that's but, you hear that kind of stuff all the time. And, right. and you know, basically just because all that narrative does to me, man, is it just says, uh, OK, well, women are really frail and, and can't right. handle right. any right. kind of con- – but men, men can handle it. It's like, OK, well, shouldn't we have those people in charge of the military, the people who don't faint when, when a bad word floats past their Victorian earlobes? Right. And, but, and I'm, but I'm kind of happy in, in a weird way. I'm kind of happy that he's doing that because I think the more – you say well, I don't think I think the more you when you the more you're being politically incorrect, I think people I don't know I don't know if this is true but people may get more comfortable with it. You understand what I'm saying? Like um, yeah yeah like like a comedian who says politically incorrect things at first like oh my god I said that but then you just get comfortable with it. He's like okay well you know you start not to caring about it like, and I think and I think a lot of women I mean they suppose they don't like him but it's like I'm glad he's saying. Um, I'm glad he's being, I'm glad he's treating women like he tre- he treats men because it's like, well, and this is what he says, right? So he says, this is from his book surviving at the top. He says, I'm not a crusader for feminism and I'm not against it either. I'm just oblivious to a person's gender when it comes to hiring people right. and handing out assignments. Right. And you know, th- that's the basic question that I've had with regards to women and minorities is like, do you want me to care that you're a woman? If you do, then don't ask me for equality. And if you don't, then don't complain if I treat you the way that I treat a man. Right. And, uh, you know, Hillary pays her female staff less than her male staffers. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's, 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 you couldn't set this stuff up to be funnier. Uh, but, of course, there's silence about that. And when it comes to the war on women, oh, man, don't even get me started. You can watch my interview with Roger Stone for more on that. But The Clinton's War on Women is a great book. Mm-hmm. And... You know, if you want to talk about the war on women, look at uh, how Bill Clinton has allegedly treated a huge number of women throughout the course of his political career, all the way from Arkansas up to the White House. And look at how Hillary reacted to these uh, allegations after saying that all women who complain of sexual abuse or assault should be believed. Mm -hmm. I mean, the idea that Donald Trump making a joke is somehow equivalent to what Bill Clinton did, enabled and supported by his wife, I mean, uh, it, it's like it's a 
weird universe where those things are even close to the same end of the scale. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it really, I, you know, like I said, it, it kind of shows the hypocrisy because at first, you know, I'm buying into it, like the war on women, no feminism, these women being hurt, hurt, hurt. And it's like, yo, I, you know, I, I, if I can help y'all, then let me help. But then it's like when your own party, when your own people do it, you don't say anything like what happened in Germany or what Bill Clinton, you know, when you want to be politically um, incorrect, it's like politically correct. It's like, yo, you were lying to me. It's like, do you really care? Or you, were you just lying to me this whole time? Right. Well, I'm just curious because I haven't had the chance to, to sort of plumb this, these questions. Torian, your, your dad, did he, you know, I, I assume this is part of it, uh, growing up black, but did your dad talk to you much about whites, white culture? Um, you know, obviously you live in a white-ish country, <laughs> not, yeah. not quite as white as it used to be, but a white-ish country. Um, what did your dad tell you about the country that you lived in and your opportunities and, and all that? Um, honestly, it, it wasn't even, I mean, it was a, just a small little snippet because he was really into you know, African-American culture and stuff like that. But it was really like, it wasn't what a lot of the other black kids got. It wasn't like, you know, the white man is the devil. There's an, there's kind of an, an, an inherent racism in the, stru in the structure. You're going to have to work twice as hard. It wasn't even really... It was discussed, but it was discussed like I don't I don't like um it wasn't discussed like like there's boundaries, there's white people who are gonna be in your way. It was never it was never talked to me like that um by my dad, you know, but I did get it from a lot of Wait, wait, hang on. I, I think we're about to pendulum over to your mom, but okay, you were no, gonna no, say no, something no. else about your dad. Go on. No, no, but no. my dad didn't, but on the other hand. No, 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 no. But but I got it. I don't know. I just, I just got it from <laughs> you know, just YouTube, what other people were talking about. When my in my household it really was like that. But it, it but early on I did feel like I did feel like white people did have an upper hand, but it, I didn't, it didn't come from my dad, though. But then eventually, you know, as I got older, I was like, yo, I kind of been lied to. You know, I don't know. Well, hang don't on. Know. So, so your dad didn't say the white people had the upper, upper hand. Did you get that from school or from peers or from your mom or where there's, you know, a, a Black Lives Matter aunt uh, hovering around the dinner table? I mean, what, where did you get that other idea from? Like, well, there, I mean, there are some people, like, there are some people in my family, they may talk about, they used to talk about, you know, like, the, the, the white man and stuff, stuff like that, you know, you know, like, aunts, like, grandmas. I, I, to be honest, I don't know, because I wasn't at those, <laughs> I wasn't at those dinners, and, right. and in fact, if I had been at those dinners, the conversation might have gone somewhat differently. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, you know, the you know part, I can't quite, <laughs> I can't quite get there. Like, I, like, I, like, I remember my, um, okay, my aunt, right? She's smart, smart as hell, real educated, making good money. But there were certain times, you know, I would just hear about, you know, you you do have a boundary, uh, excuse me, a barrier called, you know, the, the, the white man is white supremacist and people are kind of out to get you a little bit. So I did get that from her. But I mean, as I got older, I just I was like, OK, that's just bullshit. Because. But what. Um I mean, you might be successful and on smart, smart, which is great. Um, but no, what changed you into yeah. thinking that there wasn't this giant white wall of barrier nurse or something? I don't know. I think uh, I think probably two things. One, I grew up around. I mean, I, you know, I grew up around black people, middle school, high school, whatever, and I didn't want to be around a lot of these dysfunctional people who were starting fights, you know, kicking in doors, doing dumb, sh doing dumb stuff. And so I was like, okay, the white people are the least of my problems. Like y'all, <laughs> y'all need to get y'all stuff together. Like y'all. Not, not a lot of white people coming in through your window. Right, 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 right. I mean, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, and, and I don't want to say my neighborhood was like, like that, but it's like, I, I grew up around sections of my neighborhood that were, that were like that. But my, I mean, I, I had a lot of old people, old black people, you know, where I live. And so I was like, okay, white people are, you know, least of my problems, you know. And I think um, Thomas Sowell, just, 
I think seeing seeing a black man who had made it, Thomas Sowell, Walter Williams, people who are made it and who were conservatives, it was like, oh my God, like these people, these black people actually made it and they're criticizing, I don't know, they're kind of like criticizing their own people. So it, I, I was very like enlightened about it because it's like, okay, you made it, you're conservative, and and you're and you're and you're saying that you grew up in 1930, 1940s, and you have and and you feel like there wasn't really barriers in your way, and you and you still made it, and now it's 2016, but there's supposed to be huge barriers in black people's way, but white black people's way. I don't know if I'm making sense. Right. No, listen, you're making you're making perfect sense to to me, and um, it is. You know, one of the uh, it, like I feel like genuinely heartbroken about all this kind of stuff. Uh, not not what you're saying, but just a lot of this mindset. Um, I, I've spoken to some white people in my day, and uh, I'm telling you, I mean, I you know, for for the black community, we we all want you guys to do well. You know, we we all want you guys to be happy and and to succeed and and to have stable families and to not get wrapped up in the criminal justice system and to not do drugs. And, and like, I, I've never like, this has been the general sentiment when this topic has come up. It's like, you know, we're rooting for the black community. Like, come on, like, let's, let's find a way to make this better. Right. Um, but this idea, and, and I think some of this comes out in, in good ways and some of it comes out in really bad ways. Like some of this affirmative action stuff, which is I think kind of an insult, but anyway, mm -hmm. I think that there's like I've never like oh you know it's I I mean just look at it from a from a damn taxation standpoint right I mean racism is really expensive <laughs> because it's bad enough if if the mass talents of black people are not available to society as a whole but man I mean you have to really really hate your money to be a racist to the point where you want to destroy the black family put you know millions of black men and women in prison and 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 have you know millions of of uh, illegitimate babies and and millions of welfare it's like man you've got to want to hand over $10,000 a year to hold down the black community because that's what it's costing you I guess just off the top of my head as a bare minimum uh you've really really got to like hate blacks and hate your money even more. And I just, you know, from a bare economic standpoint, I don't think anybody loves their racism that much that they want to pay that amount to to hold black people down. Right, 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 yeah. Yeah, because I know, uh, as I know, like, the, the um, like, it was like the Jim Crow was like a government program, but a lot of the private businesses and the bus drivers, they didn't really like it because they were losing uh, money from it. Oh, what do you mean? Um, like the bus, the, some of the private businesses during the Jim Crow area, area era, they wanted like those black customers, but they couldn't do it because it was it was against the law. Oh yeah, people think that uh, Rosa Parks was protesting against the bus company. No, I mean bus companies want people who can't afford cars to take the bus, and that was unfortunately a lot of blacks in the day. And it was the law that the blacks had to sit at the back of the bus. It wasn't something that the bus company wanted, and yet somehow this is a protest against. The free market, not against government. Right, right, yeah. Tragic. Um, and so my, my, I know my, the second part of my question, I was talking about conservative parents and how a lot of the kids I talk to, I constantly hear, my parents are conservative, I'm not like that anymore. I'm better than them. I've, I've progressed. And it's like, mm. I'm like, what the hell do these parents do like to... To, to fail to instill those values. Okay, you know what? I think I just think I know. I think I know they did wrong. The the school system got to them before mm. before the parents did because it breaks my heart because it's like a lot of that stuff, the traditional stuff, you no know, marriage, um, um, you know, free market uh, policies, wait wait until marriage, um, two family households. A lot of that stuff is like, oh, that's 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 old school. That's old school. You sound like my dad. You sound like my grandpa. It's like, it, it breaks my heart because it's like those are important things, and it's like, what did what did their parents do to, I don't know, to not to not instill those values in them? But then, but then again, the parents are probably competing with the public school system. Well, 
Yeah, I mean, obviously you went to that school system, I'm going to assume. And did you, what was sort of the messages you were getting from the teachers about this stuff? Like in middle school, in high school, just... <clears throat> um, to, I, I'm gonna be completely honest. It was, it was, it was. Um, my high school, my middle school, it was so dysfunctional. Like people, you know, skipping class, people interrupting class. It was, it was literally like all a blur. Man. So I like we're talking the the stereotype like holes in the wall, metal detectors, and uh, um, my middle school, my middle lots school. of disruption and and very little learning. Right. Yeah. 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 And, uh, did you? I mean, was there no? I mean, I don't know. I mean, was there any chance to get you to a better school? I mean, yeah. If it's any no. consolation, my suburban, mostly suburban. I lived in a pretty bad neighborhood, but it was not a bad school. But it's mostly a blur too. It was just probably not quite as high octane a blur. Right. No, honestly, there was. But here's the thing. So I had two traditional black schools. They, I didn't say two traditional black schools, middle school and my, and my high school. And black people really care about those schools because it's in a black community, black neighborhood. And, and they want to uphold it. There's been a couple of times when they want to shut their school down, but they wouldn't let it. You know, so. You know, my dad. Because I, I, me, I knew I knew what was what it was going to be like going to those schools. I mean, luckily I was in like some you know honors class, IB classes, but still some those kids were still kind of interrupting too. Um, I wanted to go to like the number one school, you know, the top schools, but I felt like well, two well, two things. My dad, and this you know I, you know this is what I guess a, a con about my dad, whatever. But he didn't want me. Um, he wasn't as as enthusiastic as I was to get out of that thing. He was like, "Well, everything will be all right. People will be all right." You know, I was talking to my friends. We're shop, you know, my school is just fine. You won't. You will learn. You'll get through it, and things like that. You know, and and, and it's in this tradition. You know, why would you want to go to a white school? It's, it's, it's tradition. Like, you go, you're black. You go to this school. You it's it's part of our culture, right? The family, uh, the families have okay. gone to this school. My aunt, my uncles, they all went to these schools. But these schools were good back in the day, though. They're not good now. Well, because back in the day, you know, there were more stable families and more dads at home and uh, better behavior and uh, all that, right? Right. right. Yeah. Right. So it, it was opportunity for me to go, but I just and, – and, and I think the application process was very – I don't want to say daunting, but it was like, ah, oh, like I just – um, I don't know. It, you, you need – I feel like you I, – I didn't have that support to, to – to get me to the, another school. However, um, I did, okay, so so my my junior year of high school, this is a funny thing. So my junior year of high school, I had, um, I transferred, I did transfer to a better school, but besides like the, the behavior and everything like that, I wanted, And I think this, and I don't know why, but but I wanted to, um, I still wanted to take like top level classes, but this school didn't provide those A, B, A, P, I, B classes that I wanted. Mm. So I transferred back my senior year into those classes, to those classes, my senior year at that school. And, um, and not only that, but I did, I did feel more comfortable at that school because I mean, that's just part of the, you know, the culture thing. I just did feel more, I feel more comfortable at that school. However, I mean, looking looking back, I probably should have stayed at that school my my junior my junior year there. But I wanted to take some top level classes, and not only that, but I was the at that school, like my old school, like I was kind of like the top dog because you know I'm just I was like the smartest one of the smartest people. Um, at that school, but at the other school, I was a, a well, I was a small fish in a big pond. And mm. yeah, I know. No, I, I get I get what you were coming from. Yeah. yeah. So I had transferred back my you know my my senior my um senior year. So I did have an opportunity my junior year to go to that other school. But I think I don't know, I think that opportunity. I think I if anything, I wanted to leave my, my um my freshman and sophomore year because my, I think that my freshman and sophomore year, 
a lot of the smart kids, it's funny, I don't know how they did this busting thing, but a lot of the smart kids went to the other schools, and that's when I wanted to go with them. I was like, okay, my friends leaving these people in my eyes because I wanted to go with them to like those, and it was a regular public schools. I, wanted, I still want to be in a public school and I still want to be around them. And so I was, they didn't, I remember the whole busting thing because my area, I, I had, I stayed at that school, but then I did get an opportunity to go to Cato, my, um, you know, it's like a, um, it's like a, it's like a dual enrollment. So you take like CPCC courses and other classes, but I didn't, I didn't, I, I felt more comfortable, you know, being a top dog at my, at, at my old school. Right. No, I, I, I can understand that as well. I can understand that as well. And what, did you, what sparked your interest in, um, in psychology? Your show. Um, Oh, that's nice to hear. Yeah. So, uh, so basically, you were, you were you were talking about um, spanking and children and families and things like that, like two summers ago, and then I started to look inside my family and things like that, and um, you were talking about you know go to therapy, go to therapy, go to therapy, and so for me, I mean honestly, I kind of been off and on about therapy. I'm I'm going to try to be more consistent this summer though, like really getting digging in deep to it. But I did I've done a lot of work myself like in journal in journal and things like that. And so I was like, okay, if I can if I can help create better um better childhood, excuse me, better environments in the childhood so that so that you know, kids can be happier and that and and, and parents can be happier. I think that's you know, that's that's very important. I think that's one of the most important fights that that we that everyone needs to take on and stuff like that. And so, um, I pass out these um, non-spanking pamphlets around around my neighbor around the neighborhood. I started this summer around the neighborhood behind my the behind the, um, my business school the business school. And so I just pass those out and I try to and I try to tell people about spanking and things like that. And and I don't know. Like, I, I, I just think there's easy, there's easy ways, <clears throat> there's easy ways to, there's easy and practical ways to, you know, create a better, like you said, create a better society, particularly for the black community, things like that. And, and one of the ways is to stop spanking. That's just one of the ways. No, I mean, I, yeah, I don't want to say thank you because, um, you know, you're gaining great benefit out of what you're doing, but I hugely appreciate that. I mean, it's, great to hear you know that um, that what what I'm doing is getting out there and and motivating people to take on these kinds of perspectives and projects uh, that's you know I, I'm gonna stay strong but thanks <laughs> thank you very much for telling me that it's beautiful to hear yeah now you had a question at the beginning <laughs> um, I don't know what type of childhoods these people have I have uh, I just did a podcast this last week uh, where do social justice warriors come from? Uh, and there's some some theories, and I don't want to sort of go into it in detail here because I I've got a show coming out. Um, you know, we've got this everything old is square and everything new is cool thing. Right, you know, like right, you was right. you, you you were saying this about oh, you sound like my dad or my grandparents or whatever it is, and and you know they're so out of touch, and you know and now it's a hip new world, and and get hip to what's going on, and. This fetish for the new is, um, you know, Mario Rothbard, I can't remember what he called it, but it's basically like relearning old things over and over and <laughs> over again. Everything old is prejudicial and everything new is cool. And uh, what, what that means is you end up having to, well, relearn the same horrible lessons over and over and over again. And... Um, I just, it seems like we're heading in that direction. I don't know exactly how you fetishize everything that's new. I think what you do is you kind of blend everything together. Like, yeah, there's some old stuff that was bad. And, um, but that doesn't mean, you know, you throw the baby out with the bathwater. You try and separate the old stuff that was bad from the old stuff that was good. But there's this general idea, well, we're just going to wipe, wipe the slate clean and start all over according to a brave new world of infinitely malleable human nature. And um, it just, it always seems to kind of end in disaster. Communism is like, well, we'll just reorganize who owns the means of production and paradise. And, and it's just, man, um, it's, uh, it's just one of these lessons that in the absence of principles, you either love the old or you love the new. And uh, neither one is going to get you, I think, to a stable future. Mm. 
All right. Is there anything else that you wanted to mention? No, that's it. I, I really appreciate it. This is, this is, I really appreciate it. Great stuff. Well, I hope you don't have to dip your hand too much into the vat acid of social justice warrior spittle in order to get your uh, degree and, and continue on to to become a psychologist. Um, so, uh, I'm, you know, uh, you know, a bunch of stuff you have to do that you don't want to do to get get some places and they haven't made it any easier lately. But uh, I do hope that, uh, you know, you don't have to do too much to continue on with what you're doing. And man, um, you are going to do some great damn good in this world, Torian, and uh, I am uh, happy to know you. Thank you so much. Thanks, man. You're welcome back anytime.